Hi everybody, welcome to part one of a four-part series I'll be doing this week, my top 200 favorite games of all time. I feel like doing a favorite games list is something very fun and exciting and gets out a lot of personal stories and interests and maybe introduce you to some games that a favorite list is so much better than a best of list and I have to stress that I know because this is YouTube and people will be like, why isn't my favorite game on there? There are games that I would rate 10 out of 10 that don't make this list, and there are games I would rate like 6 out of 10 that do make this list, because it's all about personal taste, and I feel like a favorites list really shows you a lot about that person and really gets into their personal journey and, and how they've explored things and what taste in games really collectively over time has created what their view of video gaming is over the years. So definitely I think that's a very fun journey and I can't wait to take it with you guys. I have so much set up here. I'm going to be filming and editing all day today and tomorrow and uh, getting this all ready here. And it was interesting during this process, I think something that really stood out to me was how many games didn't make this list. You know, over time, eventually, some of the games towards the bottom, at one point, they were in the you know, 180 slot, and then eventually there are just a couple more games I like a little bit more, and they get pushed out of the 200s. So it's, it's crazy. I could have done a, a list of top, like, 500. You know, it would have been taken way too long, it would have been too much, it would have been forever, but it's just, there's so many games sitting on my shelves that are, you know, favorites of mine. They're like, well, they didn't, just didn't quite make it. They're not, they're, you know, 200 games that I like a little bit more than that. Uh, so that really is something that stood out to me and it is interesting, like how many of my favorite games just weren't quite up to that because there's so many games over the years, you don't even realize how many to really go back and think. Like, I played a lot more than I realized over the years and I always hesitated for a while doing this type of video because, especially once you get towards the lower placings, new games can come and go and there are games, uh, even older games, going all the way back to uh, the NES games in my backlog that I haven't played, and there are a handful in there, not that many, but there are a handful in my backlog that I really think will probably crack into this top 200 someday, and of course there's always a surprise, a game that you don't expect, and a couple of those in here, a game I didn't expect to be one of my favorites that became one of my favorites. The top 200, but there are a lot of games in here that have been a favorite of mine ever since I was a kid, and I don't think it will ever drop out of this list. Um, majority of this is, like, if it moves, it moves one or two spots over the next couple of decades. So I think this is a really fun and perfect time to go back and look at my top 200 favorite games. Let's go ahead and get started with number 200. Number 200 is one of those surprises I was talking about, Fantasy Life on the 3DS. This is normally not the type of game that I would really get into. I do not like Animal Crossing, my wife is a huge fan, and I do understand the appeal of it, but to me, these sl I like slice of life elements and that type of uh, living out the world through your characters and world building and that element of games within other games, in RPGs, I like those elements within them, but when the game is just that, to me, something like Animal Crossing just kind of gets boring. I need more I need more of a story, I need more um, of an ability to travel, I need a little more uh, ability to have more action elements, it's something a little more exciting to me, it's just, it, the, it's just the, the dull kind of elements of it that I don't really like, and Fantasy Life, though, really was the perfect addition to that formula because it takes the Animal Crossing formula and adds a more RPG elements. It adds more of a fantasy driven world and you do have more um, combat and more of a story that is more interactive in terms of building a greater narrative structure in an RPG form. It really is something like Dragon Quest had a baby with Animal Crossing and that's what this is. And I, it was, there was enough more kind of story structure and more narrative and more meat on the bones that the slice of life elements and the, the minigame elements and just doing the jobs and, you know, adding things to your home and doing those types of Animal Crossing type things, I actually found very enjoyable because it wasn't just that, so it never became mundane in the way that games like that normally are. So for me, I really, really enjoyed Fantasy Life. Number 199, the original Devil May Cry for the PS2. This was such an incredible experience that stuck with me over the years. And I know a lot of people prefer 4 or 3, especially 3, I think that tends to be more the fan favorite in the series. But 1 to me, there's something slightly different about this one compared to later entries. I think a lot of that comes from its roots of originally being the next Resident Evil and evolving into something different over time. I think it has a slightly different feel because of that compared to what the series became. And I just really, really enjoyed this. I loved the look and the feel of it. I liked the 
way the cinematic camera structure was done in this, I, it really added to the game. Sometimes those bother me when I don't have quite as much actual physical control over the camera in many forms, but here it, I feel like it really added to it, and I think this, to me, has my favorite atmosphere in this series, and it just is the most fun that I had in the series. I don't think it's overall the best game in the series, but by far this is the one that I've enjoyed the most, and over the years it's the one I've come back to many, many times. So I really, really enjoyed the original Devil May Cry, uh, beat out the rest of the series on this list, they'd be a little bit lower. Love this game. A very similar game at spot 198 is a game that I think objectively is not quite as good as Devil May Cry. But man, did I have so much more fun with this over the years. Surprisingly, I've come back to it more than the old Devil May Cry's. The first Gungrave game, I mentioned this in my Hidden Gems video, and this is just pure, like, almost an arcade anime-style version of something like Devil May Cry. It's not quite as intricate, it's not quite as challenging and stylish, but overall, just something about the, the sound design in this game really gets your heart thumping as you're firing off these shots and jumping through these levels and fun boss fights, and it's um, not a perfect game, but to me, it just... It's one that you can just keep coming back to, almost like an old arcade game that you'd play on something like the Genesis or the Dreamcast or something like like that. Um, you know, published by Sega here. This to me has just been so much fun and a game that I've come back to every couple of years to replay. Not quite as much with its sequel, but uh, this one has just had um, by uh, Red Entertainment. This one has just had so much entertainment value for me over the years. I ended up liking it a little more than Devil May Cry over the years, and it's, uh, it's a good example of how things can change, because when I first played them, I probably would have placed the first Devil May Cry over this, but I really have just had so much more entertainment value with this over the years, and it beat out so many other games. Number 197 is Ape Escape. And Ape Escape brings up something that, talking about my gaming history a little bit as go going through here, because I think that's a huge part of why certain games are your favorites. Um, it's more of when you played them and what was going on in your life when you played them versus the actual quality of the game. I think that those are elements that contribute even more than what the actual game is. Um, and this just that was during the day where I was a PlayStation fanatic at the end of the 90s. I was actually more of a uh, Mac and uh, Mac and PC guy and from the late 80s when I was really really little through the beginning of the 90s uh, a lot of people don't realize that because talk mostly about console games here but it wasn't until the PlayStation that I really got into consoles and it also brings up something that always bugs me the one thing that bugs me about my collection right now most of my PS1 games that have a greatest hits label are greatest hits label because uh, at some point when I went you know during my college years most of my PlayStation collection, you know, complicated reasons why, you know, various reasons over the years, but most of my PlayStation collection was gone. And I, had, in rebuying them over the years, it's mostly been greatest hits. And I'm still looking to get Black Label, some of those old games. So a lot of my favorites on the original PlayStation, you'll notice, are greatest hits versions. But Ape Escape, this is such a creative, fun series in general, but the original to me is absolutely the one I had the most memories with, and uh, having played many of them, it's still, I think, for me, the best one overall. I have really enjoyed the platforming elements here. I like the way, in at, at the time, it was very revolutionary, the way they used both the um, analog sticks for the, Dual, the original DualShock on the PlayStation, how you actually would use them to, to use your net and things like that and try and catch these mischievous monkeys, and it was such a fun, creative thing that um, on the original PlayStation, there were some really great platformers, but as far as 3D platformers and that type of thing, that's the only genre, in my opinion, where it paled in comparison to the N64. And this is one of the, the best in that system that shows that you can do that genre perfectly on the PlayStation as well. And this has just been so much fun. I really love going back into it. and has gr great gadgets to use, very creative stages, and it has a ton of replay value. And it, it sits, for me, in that perfect spot of being challenging but never really too difficult just kind of fun and you're able to come back to it over and over the years if you've not played any of the games in the ape escape series you're doing yourself a disservice you should check them out but particularly look for this one on the ps1 i still think this is the best one overall uh, it really holds up and it's so much fun and even though there have been some similar games uh, since then i feel like this still comes across as incredibly creative and it feels very innovative for the time Number 196 is Outrun for the Genesis, and for a lot of these I will talk about more my favorite version of a game, not just the systems and things that it came out on. Outrun, I do remember playing in the arcades, but that was only one or two times when I was very, very young. Most of my experience was when it was on the Genesis, the Genesis was the second system I got right after the NES, and that was one of the few games I had for it. really didn't have very many for it, and I just remember it was the idea of bringing the arcade home, because most of my experience at that time 
was with more console style exclusives or very PC oriented games. There weren't very many arcade uh, games on console or, or on PC that I owned in my collection at the time. So this was kind of, it was a unique thing for me and I think that's kind of why it stood out over the years. And it's one that I can still come back to and have a lot of fun with. It's definitely a great, great game. And I do like the further outrun games in the series and the arcades, but this original one for the Genesis has stuck with me over the years and it's still a lot of fun. Another arcade game at number 195, Area 51. And there are home ports of this game, but I've actually never played one. I kind of want to get this on the Saturn eventually. Uh, it came out on the Saturn and the PS1. I've only played this in arcades. I played the heck out of this. I used to play so many, particularly these um, light gun games in arcades. Every summer we would go to Ocean City, New Jersey, and we didn't have very many arcades near me occasionally, but it was only maybe four or five times a year outside of the week I would go to the beach that I would play arcade games at home. So it was a huge treat. I remember as a kid I'd save up like stacks and of quarters, go with all these rolls of quarters weighing down my pants. I had to wear a belt on pants I normally wouldn't wear because they're just full of quarters. And you'd go down and during the week or two we were at the beach every single summer. I'd go to every arcade down there and we'd play so many light gun games. We'd play, you know, like uh, all like Mortal Kombat and Marvel vs. Capcom and the Dungeons and Dragons uh, beat em up games and things like that. And later on my friend Matt and I had a lot of fun with the initial D arcade games, but this is one that always stood out to me. Area 51, I really, really enjoyed it. I like it much more than Maximum Force. That one was okay, but Area 51, I really, really enjoyed, and I can't wait to try out a home port because, again, I've never played one, so it's the arcade version of Area 51. Pixel Junk Monsters Deluxe on the PSP comes in at spot 194. This is an amazing tower defense game. By far my favorite tower defense game of all time. I played the hell out of this. Um, I remember one time we were stuck home at night because of a really big storm. I forget what plans we had, but I was, you know, just kind of complete change of plans. Didn't get to do what we were going out to do. And I just stayed home and played this for like six hours straight the one time. That was the first time I played it. It had been sitting in my collection for a while, just hadn't checked it out. And I loved it and I kept picking it back up over and over again. And when I bring the PSP places as I'm going somewhere, this is usually one of the games that I bring with me because it's such a great just pick up and play game and redo stages for better scores and that type of thing. But yeah, if you've not tried this and you enjoy tower defense games, you need to check this out. This is so much fun. Um, absolutely love this game and earned a spot on top 200. The next few get back into that 90s and early 2000s arcade spirit when I would go every summer to the beach and play arcade games. And uh, I would also play arcade games in elementary school. I did an after school bowling league uh, with a lot of my friends from my elementary school. And before and after, while we were waiting for things to start or waiting for our parents to come pick us up, they had an arcade there. And that's where I played a lot of arcade games too as a young kid. And a lot of those, again, were light gun games. I love those. And I'm very slowly building a collection of those favorite arcade games now on console. Consoles. Number 193 is Time Crisis 2 in the arcades. I really, really enjoyed the mechanic of the Time Crisis series, particularly in the first two, uh, being able to step on the paddle to, uh, to, to, to shoot and then the, you hold back to crouch and reload. And it was an interesting mechanic and different than just the general shoot, 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 and then shoot off screen, that type of thing. Um, to, to reload. It was a very interesting mechanic that stood out and I think the first two were designed so incredibly well and I loved the way they were structured for uh, particularly Time Crisis 2 with the two-player structure. I liked playing that one with friends, getting the, the two different perspectives instead of just one screen and you're both shooting at the same thing, having a little bit of a different perspective for the two characters. It was a very cool, un unique thing that I think the franchise after 2 was still good, but it kind of lost a little bit of that magic. The game that I liked a little bit more, just a little bit more than Time Crisis 2 is the original Time Crisis. And I think that's just because that was the first time that I experienced that mechanic and I really, really enjoyed it. I think uh, 2 overall, I had more fun in the multiplayer experience uh, than the original Time Crisis, but over the years I think the original Time Crisis, that nostalgia factor of it really makes me overall like it a little bit more and want to go back to it more than Time Crisis 2. Sticking in that same genre for a bit, number 191, Ninja Assault. The PlayStation 2 actually has a lot of really good light gun games and a couple of exclusives, and this is one Ninja Assault, and it sounds ridiculous, you're running around ninjas with guns but it is so much fun. It is so much more fun than I thought it was going to be. This is one of those games that really surprised me because I thought it was going to be just kind of another mediocre console version of these really fun arcade games that I remembered playing. And it is an absolute blast to play. You should check it out. 
Number 190, Virtua Cop 2 on the Sega Saturn. Had an absolute blast with this. One of my favorite pick up and play Sega Saturn games and a fun one to play with friends. And just edging that out though, for some reason, I've always liked the first Virtua Cop just a tiny bit more. So number 189, the first Virtua Cop on the Sega Saturn. Number 188, the original Halo, and this is, my wife was very surprised this made it this far up on my list and that there were a lot of games, including some RPGs, that were in the sort of the 300 range that this beat out, because I really dislike the Halo franchise as a whole. But before there was Halo, before Bungie was owned by Microsoft, Bungie was one of my favorite companies, and there are actually some older Bungie Mac games higher up on this list. I really, really loved that company starting with things like Marathon, and I was primarily a Mac gamer, so they were one of the biggest companies for me in the 90s. And this was originally already in development for the Mac before Microsoft got their hands on them, and I feel like this still has more of that old-school Bungie appeal for me than later iterations of the series, which became, to me over time, the Halo series became very bro-gamer, and it became much more focused on the online multiplayer than a uh, good, fun, quality, first-person experience, uh, you know, one-player experience, and that's just my personal taste of having played Halo 2 and 3 over the years. This is really the only one that I like, and I had such a fun time with this, and for a while this was the multiplayer game of choice when we had, you know, friends would come over and play this for a good a solid you know six months to a year this is kind of the only thing we played so I had a lot of it's more about the memories that I have with my friends um, in high school going in and well, I guess in middle school going into high school playing Halo the original Halo Combat Evolved and the original Xbox I have a lot of great memories tied to it and it's still a fun one to come back to and for me personally it has the best single player experience of that series and I think a lot of those memories and just the the love of Bungie before they became just kind of a halo company really makes this one stand out to me. Some more arcade memories with number 187 Crazy Taxi. I loved playing this in the arcades but overall I enjoyed the Dreamcast version more being able to have this at home that's one thing that I love about the Dreamcast uh, even with all its great RPGs and everything I think probably one of my number one favorite things is it is in my opinion one of the greatest consoles ever for arcade games and particularly if you enjoy arcade games of a certain era really enjoyed Crazy Taxi it's just a ton of fun super fast paced and right above that, number 186, another Dreamcast game, Space Channel 5. The only rhythm-based game I have ever enjoyed. There's something about the style and just the vibe of this game and, and the music, and I just, I really, really find it incredibly enjoyable. And it's one of the few Dreamcast games I had back when that first, uh, the console was first out. So over the years, it's really just kind of stuck with me because of the, the memories of my first experience with the Dreamcast. And uh, this just is a very nostalgic game for me, and one that I still think is a heck of a lot of fun, and is still just a stylish good time. Number 185, the original Persona. I actually played this on for the PS1 the first time, but I think everyone pretty much knows if you're into RPGs how butchered that version was for the American localization, and I just I did have very negative memories of that game. I think I'd like it more if I played it again. I haven't replayed the PS1 version since then. I just remember really not enjoying it. And then later on, getting into the Persona series with the Eternal Punishment Persona 2, uh, which, you know, you know, part two, but we got this one we got here on PS1 in the United States. I really liked that and thought, maybe I'll go back and replay Persona 1. Maybe I was just in the, the, the wrong mood or the, there was the wrong time for me to play that, and I never did. So I'm very glad that eventually we got this uh, upgraded PSP version, and I really enjoy it. I still don't like it as much as later iterations in the series. I don't think the... For me, the characters in the story weren't quite as strong, even going back and replaying this better version, but it's still a heck of a lot of fun, and still has a, a at this point, it still feels very much like more of a Shimigami Tensei game, not quite what Persona would become, and it just it's not quite as good as some later iterations in the series, but still just a, a fun RPG with some great sort of dungeon crawling elements and kind of the stuff that makes uh, Shimigami Tensei unique. Number 184, Wachenroder, a really, really cool strategy RPG that is exclusive to the Sega Saturn. And it has a very interesting steampunky fantasy design to it and a really interesting introduction sequence when you first boot it up. It's a mix of CGI and it looks like almost like almost claymation, like action figure type effects. It looks really, really cool. And when you get into it, 
it's really nothing that's uh, groundbreaking in any way, it's just a very a very fun strategy RPG with a cool art style, and it's fun to play on the, the Saturn. Why I really, really enjoy this game is this is the first game that I ever fully played through in Japanese, and I was able to accomplish that because it's a very linear game. Not quite in a negative sense, though. It actually has a very good flow to where it is very much story, conversation, combat, and then move to the next area. Story, some conversation, combat, and the majority of the game just kind of follows that narrative. Um, but it does so in a way that doesn't feel super limiting. It just kind of feels like it has a great forward momentum and, it, and just kind of keeps moving you along. And this is a game, if you are curious, there are lots of English language guides for this. So anytime I did get stuck or anytime I couldn't uh, you know, figure out some of the story or there was a bunch of you know, kanji at some point, you can look up. There's a lot of guides online for this game. I think this was a popular one, I think, to, to import and had a lot of good translations pretty early on. It's just a very fun... RPG on the Saturn, and it's the first RPG that I played through on that system, and the first game I played fully in Japanese, so it has a lot of great memories for me. Number 183, the original Alone in the Dark on the Mac, the Alone in the Dark series I really enjoyed. This one stands out because this is the first game I ever played with a genuine sort of horror vibe to it, and has almost a Lovecraftian style in many ways to the story that it's telling. and. It's one that I really want to go back and replay because I haven't played it since I was a kid, but I have so many great memories with it that um, it, it stuck with me enough to really earn a spot on this list. Number 182 is Black and White, uh, Mac and PC. I really enjoyed playing that back in the day. One of my favorite developers from that, that era, and I, as far as the sort of God Simulator strategy type games, this is definitely one of my favorites in that genre. And to me, it just it, ha it really stands out with its sense of style and humor, and has a great lasting appeal over the years. Number 181, Phantasmagoria. I loved this game when I very first played it. For some reason, uh, FMV games at the time really fascinated me. I just thought they were so cool, even when they were awful. And Phantasmagoria, though, had enough genuine quality mixed in with the stuff that made FMV good and bad that it made it more playable and it was a lot of fun. And for some reason, I remember when I first played it, I thought it was just outright hilarious and at the same time somewhat disturbing and that, that perfect blend, it was kind of like the experience of watching a really funny, gory B-movie and it just really is an experience that has stuck with me and something I still look back upon very fondly. Number 180, Grim Fandango, one of the genres of games that fell a little bit below this 200 list into the 3 and 400 range, didn't quite make it, are the old point-and-click adventures, a lot of the DOS era, like LucasArts games and things like that. I played a lot of those growing up. The One of the few that really made it on this list because I just have such fond memories of it and it, it's a game that holds up so well as Grim Fandango. To me, that was just so incredibly creative and I think overlooked in many ways at the time, uh, not by reviews but in terms of sales. And I think it has a lot more of a, a fan base and a greater appreciation now, but Grim Fandango is fantastic. Number 179, Star Trek 25th Anniversary, the old Mac Play version, that's what I first played. This is actually the first game that I really have a vivid memory of playing is this game down in our old basement in my uh, parents' old house a couple of homes ago where we first lived back near my old elementary school and going down the basement and playing on that computer, the first home computer that my family had and it was a brand new thing and I just remember being addicted to this for a while because this was when I was very young watching Star Trek Next Generation and re-watching uh, reruns and things like that, the original series and being able to play this, it felt like, oh my gosh, I'm playing an episode of Star Trek, and it just really stuck with me over the years. Uh, I've since then played the NES version, uh, I did a review of that a while ago, and it was kind of fun, but that original version of it um, that I played on the Mac, that just, I have so many great memories, and it's just such an incredible experience. It felt, I never felt like felt that before, where you're really entering the world of a TV series that you're watching. Number 178, SSX 3. I didn't like this quite as much when it first came out as SSX and SSX Tricky because of the changes made to it, but over time I've like come to like it more and more, I get more used to that more open world feel of the mountain, and I love doing, uh, towards the end we could do the mountain run the whole way from the top to the bottom, and, and the way the environment feels so much more alive, and, and it doesn't quite lose the arcade feel because it 
on paper it almost sounded like they were trying to go a little bit more uh, realistic with the way the big open exploration of the mountain but they didn't it still kept that arcade feel still kept that crazy style of something like tricky it was a heck of a lot of fun and a game that i think is gorgeous on the playstation 2 just barely edging that out at 177 is tony hawk's pro skater 3 um, again one where i really enjoyed the first two a little bit more than the third game, but this, I think, in many ways also expanded upon what the first two games created. I think this is in some ways a, a bigger experience. I put a lot more time into this one as far as the single player career mode, I think, than the first two, but I didn't put anywhere near as much time in the multiplayer with friends or the, uh, the, the part creator, the map maker element. For some reason, I didn't find that quite as enjoyable, but I come back to every few years almost the career mode and go through and replay it again and I don't always try and get like 100% and everything anymore uh, like I did back then but going through and kind of doing some of my my more favorite tricks and doing some of my, the my more enjoyable stages and that kind of stuff it's a fun game to come back to and I think has a ton of replay value and earned a spot on this list just because it's one that I constantly come back to and I just I find myself enjoying it a little more as time moves on than when I originally did. Number 176, the original Resident Evil on PS1, and as a big fan early on of the original Alone in the Dark, there were enough similarities that I saw in previews of this and watching one of my friends play this before I owned it, that I'm like, I kind of want to give this a shot. It seems kind of like a little more horror-driven, a little more action-oriented version of that game that I remembered playing, you know, just not a few years earlier, really. And so I, I picked it up, I tried it out, and I loved it. And again, I love the opening sequence really sold it for me because I really was enjoying in the 90s those FMB games and the, the cheese factor of it I just found very fascinating. And that alone caught me and then the, the, the horror elements of it and it just it felt so much fun. And the survival horror elements of it really made me come back to it again because I had a lot of fun with that. And it was one of the first games that I really got that feeling um, of, of survival and that the tension from not just having unlimited resources and really feeling more like you're in grave danger. I'd only played a couple games before then that really gave me that feeling and this had enough fun elements to it that it kept me coming back. Number 175 is another Resident Evil, one I like a little bit more than the original. I definitely think it's a much better game uh, as far as personal enjoyment. It only edges it out a tiny bit, but Resident Evil Code Veronica, this is the uh, Japanese Dreamcast version here, the really cool slip cover and there's the, the front then. Um, I really, really enjoyed this game. I originally played it on a friend's Dreamcast just once, and I don't think I even finished it, And I remember, but I remember really liking it, so I was happy then, just a couple years ago, to pick up the Japanese Dreamcast version, and it is super exciting. This is one that climbed my, my list very, very quickly when I went back and played it again, because to me, this... While not my favorite Resident Evil, spoiler, a couple, a couple you know, ahead of this, I probably had the most genuine fun in my first uh, real playthrough when I sat down and played it again on Dreamcast after just kind of playing a little bit at a friend's house one time. Um, I just really got into it and kind of went through and beat it in you know, two days, just played for a few hours one night, came back and played it, because it was just, I think I really enjoyed the the structure of the way you travel throughout the game here. I feel like the I like the puzzles a little bit more than some of the other Resident Evils. I like the, the story elements a little bit more. I just really, really enjoyed Code Veronica. Speaking of Resident Evil, number 174 is Resident Evil 4 for the GameCube. This is still my favorite version of this game to date. I have it on the Wii. Um, uh, I just There's something about this it originally being a GameCube exclusive, later came to PS2 and stuff like that, but I really love this on the GameCube, and I wasn't huge into the GameCube uh, back in the day. I had a, a decent number of games, but a lot of them were games I played once and didn't really touch again. This is one of the few that I still come back to to this day. I really enjoy this, and I was actually a little bit wary of this when it first came out because of the changes made, and I know that this is, in many ways, some people herald this as the best of the series, some people don't like it because they see it as being the catalyst to future changes in the series and how it moved away from its roots. Um, but to me, I think this has that in between. I think this has the best of old Resident Evil mixed with the best of what Resident Evil would become without the worst elements of either one of them. It doesn't have the tank controls and other issues of the older games, and I feel like it didn't become too heavily action-oriented like uh, for like, uh, 5 and 6. I think this was a perfect blend, and to me, um, in many ways, it is the pinnacle of the series, in my opinion. I just really enjoy how the changes that they made seem to be more of an evolution of the old way the series was, 
rather than being just a completely you know left turn and a complete change to the series. Uh, that being said, there is one more Resident Evil I uh, like a little bit more than this, and it's largely because of just the nostalgia factor. But overall, I would say this is probably the best, and I just have a lot of fun with the GameCube version of this game. Sticking with the GameCube for number 173, we have Lost Kingdoms, which I did a review on on my channel, and I'm still looking for a copy of Lost Kingdoms too. I've never physically seen a copy. I really would like to play it because I've heard they've improved a lot. Um, this is a game that has quite a few little flaws in it, but overall it was just so much fun and so different. I normally am not a fan of card-based style things, whether it's you know even like you know like Yu-Gi-Oh games and that type of thing, or whether it's just kind of here where you're using them as a way to summon things. I just for some reason the the, the idea of the card mechanic has never been something that super appealed to me. But I had a lot of fun to this. I think a lot of it comes from it being a From Software game and being a big fan of the, the uh, Kingsfield series and the Shadow Tower and that kind of stuff. I just really enjoyed the general feel and art style of this game, and it really drew me in. And it's one that I've replayed a couple of times just because it's. It is a lot of fun, and it's one of those games that you can burn through in a, in a few hours, especially once you really have played it a couple times, and uh, it's just kind of a fun game to come back to. Next two I want to talk about in conjunction a little bit, number 172 and 171, the GameCube exclusive, beautiful, if you've not seen these gorgeous RPGs, Baton Kaidos and Baton Kaidos Origins, a, a prequel here, uh, just amazing. and. There are very, very, very few exclusive RPGs on the GameCube, so to get something this great and to be a series by Monolith Soft, oh yeah, I had to have them, really liked them, and like Lost Kingdoms before it, I'm not a massive fan of card-based battle systems, and I think that kept me from enjoying it quite as much as I could have over the years, but oh my gosh, I, they just amazing. I love the world that they created. I love... The, the visuals in this are incredible, the soundtrack, um, I really got into the story and the characters overall, just everything about it is just incredible. I just kind of wish the battle system was a little bit different, but even in saying that, it was implemented very, very well and it feels very creative and unique in many, many ways, so uh, just a fantastic game, and I just like the origins just a little bit more. Visually, I find it a little bit more appealing, and I kind of got a little bit more into the overall story. Um, just this to me, I think is just minor improvements overall. But uh, I know a lot of people like the, I think the first one. I think more people like better. But as much as I love this uh, Origins, I like just a little bit more. An incredible duology here on the GameCube. Uh, just an amazing exclusive series that I really would like to see them come back to. Continuing on with number 170 on the Xbox 360, South Park: The Stick of Truth. I've always been a big fan of South Park. Even back when I was in uh, elementary school and I wasn't allowed to watch it at home, my mom said it was a horrible devil show. I watched every single episode at a friend's house, so I've always been a, friend, uh, a fan of South Park. And the South Park games, though, up until this point, have been pretty disappointing. They've been all been pretty awful. I played all of them and. Just not worth your time or money. Uh, then finally, we got a great South Park game, and what really surprised me because a lot of it took me a while to play this um, because a lot of my friends really enjoyed it and they gave it a lot of great reviews. So I was really excited, and when I finally got my hands on it, but I had no idea how wonderful of an actual RPG it was. I knew it was an RPG, obviously, but I didn't realize how fantastic until I played through it myself. Those elements turned out. It actually turned out to be not just an incredibly funny game, not just an incredible fun way of experiencing the town of South Park and a South Park story finally for the first time getting a good experience out of that, but the RPG elements taken on their own, taken outside of uh, just the South Park setting, are actually pretty decent. It was a really good RPG and just a heck of a lot of fun, and I can't remember the last time a game had me laughing out loud so many times. Just an incredible experience. I really, really enjoyed this game, one I'm definitely going to come back to, and um, yeah, one that easily earns a spot on this list. Number 169, uh, again as far with uh, Star Trek, I really love when there's a good Star Trek game because there's a lot of bad ones, but there are some really great ones that really make you feel like you're a part of that world or you're playing through an episode of that show, and one of those that really stood out to me over the years was Star Trek Voyager Elite Force. I loved this game, I still love this game, I still play this game. Um, it's a really good first person shooter, it's actually good enough. Um, uses uh, the, Qu the Quake engine and things like that, and it, just, it turns out so fantastic. It's a good enough of a first-person shooter that even if you're not a Star Trek fan, even if you've never seen a single episode of Voyager, I really think you should go 
find a copy of this and check it out. It's not um, super sought after. It really doesn't go for a lot, particularly on you know, PS2 title, fairly early game. It's actually a really fun, well-made first-person shooter. Even outside of its connection to the Star Trek license, it's so much fun. I played this a lot with friends. I played, you know, this the single player through. I don't know how many times over the years. Because then on top of that, it plays like a pretty decent episode of Voyager. So overall, I mean, there are so many reasons to like this game, whether you're a fan or not. But if you are a fan of Voyager, and I love Star Trek Voyager, one of my favorite shows ever, I adore this game. Number 168, Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance, the PlayStation 2 version here. I have so many fond memories with this game because I enjoyed the Baldur's Gate games on the PC, and I really enjoy Diablo, and this was kind of a perfect fusion of the Diablo, the Diablo formula with not just the world, but the, the style and the feeling of Baldur's Gate. It genuinely felt like a very competent fusion of those things to make a more action-packed kind of dungeon crawlery version of Baldur's Gate, an RPG that I really, really enjoyed. And then you have on top of that the multiplayer element, which gave it a ton of replay value for me over the years, and like unlocking Drizzt and stuff like that. I have so many memories playing this game. Uh, fairly early uh, PlayStation 2 game that we played so much over the years, and this came out during a time when I was still, I haven't played in years, but when I was still playing Dungeons and Dragons with my friends. So to be able to have then another game that we could play as a, as a two-player experience in the world of uh, worlds that we we're experiencing in the realm of tabletop gaming, this was just came out at the perfect time to be such a fun adventure. Number 167 is a game that has never had a home port of any kind. It's an arcade exclusive, and it's so depressing because I will never own an arcade machine like this. It's way too big and expensive, but Carnival. I love light gun games in the arcades. I have so many memories with them. There were a bunch earlier on this list. If you're watching this whole video, there's a bunch later on on this list. I really like arcade light gun games. This is one of my favorites. It's so fun and quirky and, and goofy at the same time. It's just a very enjoyable, fun game, and it's disappointing that it's never left the arcade. Number 166 is The Last Story on the Wii, which I think is a very love it or hated game. Some people, when it came out, were very disappointed and said uh, it was one of the most disappointing RPGs of that year. Other people heralded it as, my gosh, this is incredible, and being so excited that was part of the, that, that old the Operation Rainfall like trilogy of RPGs that we got finally on the Wii. I love this limited edition with the, 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 the book style here. Uh, just absolutely incredible. I, I really liked this game. I feel like it... In a w some elements of it, as far as the exploration of the world, I do agree there are parts of it that don't quite hold up to what it could have been, but it looks fantastic, uh, particularly for the Wii at the time. I love the art style, I enjoyed the voice acting, I love the uniqueness of the combat. I think that's one of the main things, the way you actually move through the world and the way the combat engine works here, I think that was one of the things that a lot of people were had a love or hate issue with. I really, really thought it was a lot of fun, it was very creative and unique. And I just had a blast playing that game, and it's one that I've, I've replayed twice now, and I'll probably replay again years from now, go back to, because I just had a lot of fun, and it was great to have another fun RPG on the Wii, because I've really, really been enjoying the Wii, um, a system that I really underrated uh, as compared to its, its other counterparts, but when you find a great RPG on the Wii, it's a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed the last story. Number 165, I had mentioned Baldur's Gate talking about Dark Alliance, the original Baldur's Gate on PC. I remember the old version, I don't even remember how many discs it was, like 10 or 12 or some ludicrous number. I don't have my old copy anymore, but holy cow, I just remember it being this massive experience and getting engrossed in the world of Baldur's Gate. And that first one, I mean, overall, like 2 is also very good, and the expansion of 2 and stuff like that, and there have been lots of great worlds, um, adventures in the Baldur's Gate realm, but that Baldur's Gate, that RPG, on the PC, holy crap, that was incredible. That was just such a, an amazing experience at the time. I was heavily into playing Dungeons and Dragons and just an RPG that I will never forget and will always be one of my favorites. Number 164, kind of it feels like weird going from Baldur's Gate to this one, the Oregon Trail, the old original Oregon Trail version, vanilla Oregon Trail. I remember playing that in school so much. Like so many people I think in the US have memories of during computer class, you know, when you're not doing typing or any math stuff, math munchers, and that kind of thing. The Oregon Trail I think was a staple for 90s kids, uh, in particular I think in elementary schools. And holy cow, I just have so many great memories of that. And and it just it's such a weird thing. It's kind of a simple, very simple learning game, but I have a lot of memories with the game, enough that it beats out a lot of fantastic games to still be one of my favorites. And I actually have a 
a decent little collection going over by the PC games of the Oregon Trail games and uh, Amazon Trail and African Trail and all those ones are just kind of fun educational games. And the Oregon Trail though uh, is still one of my absolute favorites because of those memories of elementary school. Next, the original Crash Bandicoot at 163. It launched one of my favorite characters from that era just because I had so much fun with the different games in that series. Beating it out just a little bit is Crash Tag Team Racing, the third of the Crash uh, Racing games. And this one, it seemed to me more than anything just trying to be Mario Kart Double Dash and not quite succeeding. I still obviously really, really enjoy this game, but not quite as much as the the first two. I feel like this is where, I feel like this is why we didn't get a fourth one. It focused a lot more on the weird structure of stuff outside the racing even. You had some mini games, you had a little more physical explora exploration just as Crash in sort of the overworld elements, and I didn't feel like it didn't quite mesh all the ideas, and I wasn't a big fan of the tag team element, and that's just personal taste. But outside of those things, just Having fun racing and playing against friends, still one of my favorite racing games of all time for that element alone. The single player I didn't enjoy quite as much, and some of the changes I didn't enjoy quite as much as the older games, but just sitting and playing a racing game with friends, this is one of the best games I've ever played for that, just uh, a lot of fun. Then in 161, we get Crash 2, which I think improved on just about everything from the original Crash, and just beating that out. In spot 160 is Crash 3, which I think was the pinnacle of that. I think a lot of the other ones, after Naughty Dog left, the other Crash games have been very hit or miss, and I haven't really enjoyed a heck of a lot of them, but I think 3 was sort of the pinnacle of that element of, of that series, and they get perfected everything that Crash 1 and 2 created. Number 159, another game that I remember playing the Mac Play version of and having a ton of fun with that playing. I played with my uh, friend Matt a lot and over the years I've really enjoyed being able to very easily ex and having an accessible version of it on the PS1, Descent. Descent is a heck of a lot of fun if you've not played this. I really really enjoy Descent and it works very well on the PS1 and it's one of those few uh, that you can use a link cable for on the uh, PlayStation. You have two TVs and that type of thing and uh, this is just an absolute blast and I think as far as games of this style, it really holds up Descent 1 and 2, but Descent 1 is the one I have a lot of memories with, and I just, this was a heck of a good time, and I'd never played anything like it before when it first came out, and it's, you know, it's like Doom, but you're flying in a ship through all the different hallways, and uh, it's just, it's a incredible, explosive, fun time, really fast-paced, and one you should really check out. Number 158, another one I've reviewed on this channel before, Evil Zone. And this is, I really enjoy this because of the uniqueness of it. I like the way it's very much structured, kind of like a really bizarre little mini anime series uh, with all the different character designs and uh, the way the one player is structured almost like next time on you know, Evil Zone. That type of thing was very interesting and creative in a fighting game, but what really stood out was the fighting system. It is a very unique system. Definitely check out that review I did to really get more in depth with that, but that to me was something that was so much fun and so incredibly unique, and I've never seen another fighting game since that uses a system like it, and that really, I think, keeps this as being one of my favorites, is that it feels so unique. Number 157 is Tomb Raider Underworld, and this is this port is so incredibly different from its uh, console versions as compared to, say, the PSP version of Legend versus the other ones. That's just a portable version, really, and mostly the same. This uh, this Tomb Raider game, completely redone in a side-scrolling fashion, is so different that I actually this game is on here twice. Uh, Tomb Raider Underworld. This is a very it's almost a completely different game, just with the same story. Really, it's different enough that I consider it a very different game. Um, not quite as good as its console big brothers in any way, but I was very surprised with how much I enjoyed this, and I love Tomb Raider, Larkoff's one of my favorite characters, and I just had such a great time playing this on, on the DS, and it's one that I'm definitely going to replay again. I think that it, it, I was amazed at how well they did the transition to this kind of Metroidvania side-scrolling version of Tomb Raider Underworld, and fabulous, and again, one of my favorite games. Sticking with the DS, number 156, Plants vs. Zombies which, Plants vs. Zombies, this game is more addictive than it deserves to be. It is, it's a great game, but holy cow, once you, once you really get into this game, it's hard to stop playing. It is so, just amazing. My wife and I played the heck out of this when we first grabbed it on the, on the DS. I played a little bit of it back in the day on the PC, my friend Matt had it. Uh, I never really owned a copy though, but when I got it on the DS, 
I played this to death, and I really want to replay it. And you know what I would really like? I would love to see another Plants vs. Zombie game, but more like this. Not the way the Plants vs. Zombie games have evolved over time. I, it just doesn't appeal to me. I would love a sequel that um, is very much like the original Plants vs. Zombie and Plants vs. Zombies. And this is just an unbelievable amount of fun. And again, it's it's one of the most addictive games I've ever played, and that's why it still is one of my favorites. 155 is my least favorite main line entry in one of my top two favorite series, Final Fantasy II. Um, this, over the years, I mean, the PSP version easily is my, my favorite version of the game, um, and it makes it much more enjoyable in my eyes, and it still, again, makes it to the top 200, but as far as the Final Fantasy goes, I really love the original Final Fantasy, and I really love Final Fantasy after this. Some of the changes in here were incredibly innovative and creative, I feel like, for the time, especially when I very first uh, was able to get my hands on this and play it. I enjoyed it, but I don't know, there's something about it, I don't know what it is, there's something about it that just never quite captured me the way many other games in the series did. It was one where I found it to be a very enjoyable RPG, and it still feels very Final Fantasy to the point where it makes it on my top 200 of all time, but there's something about it that is always with the the changes to just the way the game is played. Overall, it's just, it's my least favorite in one of my favorite series, and it's still enjoyable enough. I played it through twice. Um, this, I love the PSP version in comparison to anything else. Uh, the PS1 version, I think, was the first one I played before I went back and played any other one. Um, it just never quite captured me the same way other Final Fantasies did, but still a very enjoyable RPG experience. It still has that Final Fantasy feel. And just edging that out at 154 is Final Fantasy X-2. Um, this, again, is one where, to me, it's one of the most disappointing sequels I've ever played, but I still really liked it, and that's a weird thing to say, but this is a, a strange game for me because I feel like in comparison to Final Fantasy X, it's an awful sequel, but just in its own right, in its own merits, it's actually a very fun game, um, and a very fun RPG, and I actually really like the battle system once you get into it and get more into it as the game moves on. So it's a weird one where I actually had a ton of fun playing Final Fantasy X too. It's one of my absolute favorite games to go back and play, but when I compare it, uh, particularly story-wise, to Final Fantasy X, it falls so far short of that. Uh, so it's an odd one where I have very much a love-hate relationship with this game, where there's parts of it that I just detest, but I have so much fun and I come back to it every once in a while, and it, it earned a spot in the top 200 because I just I find it to be a very enjoyable, flawed game. Number 153 is Star Ocean First Departure. I never played the original Super Famicom version of this game, but I very much enjoyed it um, in many ways uh, because I enjoy the Tales of series, and it's kind of a sci-fi tales that turns into very fantasy and evolves some of its own elements that are very different, but in many ways it does feel very much like, uh, like a Tales game, the first two of these, it just uh, with more of a sci-fi structure. Um, and I really enjoyed Star Ocean First Departure. I enjoyed it a little bit more, though, uh, Star Ocean 2, which I played first on the PS1, but I actually prefer Second Evolution on the PSP, and, I, and to me, this um, improved pretty much every element of the first Star Ocean. To me, having played both of these on the, PS, on the PSP, really love both of these games. 2, to me, just does everything a little bit better. Um, one that I know, some, <laughs> some people that I know hate this one, and other people love it as their favorite in the series. I'm one of those that loves it as their favorite in the series, but Star Ocean, till the end of time, I really like this game. To me, story-wise, as far as story and the characters, it's slightly inferior to 2. I still like it better than 1, but as far as the music and the visuals and the the combat, or the, any, pretty much everything gameplay-wise, I prefer this one by far the most of the series. I'm glad to have this cool kind of uh, collector's edition version, version of this here. Um, I really, really just, I like this game. I understand why some people don't like it as much as 1 and 2, but yeah, I just, I love this because of the, the different back cover and things like that. Really pretty addition here. I, I, I get it, but to me, I really, really enjoy it, and I actually just have, I have more fun playing and re-experiencing this one. It just, it feels like such a, a grand adventure that I love to go back to. Number 150, um, there's a lot of RPGs in here in this kind of little RPG bubble, and a lot of them are sequels to games that I'll reveal are somewhere a little bit higher on this list, but uh, Ligaia 2, really, really enjoyed this. I think that the the art style, to me, felt so much less colorful and creative, and I think it, it lost a lot for me visually, um, and even the soundtrack in many ways, compared to the first game, where it just it doesn't hold that same 
gorgeous uh, artistic quality that really makes it stand out to me. It feels a little more drab and a little more um, sort of gets lost in the pack visually amongst the many RPGs of its time, but it still has a fantastic combat system. Uh, Ligaia 1 and 2 is actually, actually has my favorite turn-based battle system ever. I really, really love it. It's still a lot of fun. Story-wise, again, doesn't quite live up to the first one, but it's still a fantastic story. And this is a game you should check out because this is a game that I feel like almost no one has played. Uh, the, the first one may be still an overlooked one. This one, beyond overlooked. I think just totally forgotten. And, um, you know, it, it's an amazing game. Not always the best sequel overall. Uh, you don't necessarily, you don't have to have played the first game to play this, really. I think you get more out of it if you have, but you don't have to at all. It's very standalone by itself and just, um, it just a remarkably fun game to play overall. And the story isn't incredible, but it's good enough to where it is very enjoyable. You get attached to the characters. And I just had so much fun playing this game, um, partially because I just love that combat engine. And it just, it's a very fun RPG. Number 149, a game that I really actually kind of refused to play for a few years because I really didn't think I was going to like it, but ended up absolutely loving it, Crisis Core, Final Fantasy VII, and two different you know, versions here. But uh, yeah, this is an amazing game, and I think the thing that I thought I was not going to like about it was the combat. I really think that that mechanic, I really wanted it to be more like the original Final Fantasy VII. I think it really turned me off looking at it, but I'm very glad I finally got to play it um, just a couple of years ago because I really, really enjoyed this game. And as much as I did enjoy the, the gameplay, and I felt like it really fit the structure of the way the game was presented more than an, an older turn-based style might have worked, I actually think my favorite part of this entire experience is the story by far. And I think the one thing that is almost a negative but is also a very big positive if you if you can understand is that it almost makes me enjoy the story of Final Fantasy 7 a little bit less because elements that are presented in here are in some ways better I think the overall story I do like Final Fantasy 7 more but I think in some aspects and in some parts it actually outshines it and I think in a way it kinda almost hurt my memory a little bit of Final Fantasy 7 I'm kinda like Wow, this there's so much like greatness in here. I would love to see. I would love to see a complete package of those kind of put together, um, redone, not in the way where I think we're seeing the Final Fantasy VII remake. But I'd love to see them put together, and I'd love to see a physical console release of this game. That would be really really cool. I'm actually surprised that has never happened. Uh, that would be interesting. But yeah, Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII. I'm so happy I went back and and finally got a chance to play it because I was turned off a bit and ended up being an amazing experience. And again, one of my favorite PSP games. Number 148, a PS2 launch game. One of the first games I played on that system. I got a lot of PS2 games the first two years that system was out. Kessen. I love real-time strategy games on the PC, and those have not always been handled the best in translation to consoles, and I think here they did such a fantastic job because this was made specifically for the PS2, not for the PC, and it was not it was one of the few instances where you got a really good strategy game that was made for that, and it wasn't very slow-paced uh, like Nobunaga's Ambition or things like that. It was very much, I think, more in the style of something like a Warcraft or Starcraft in a bit. Um, but very consoleized, and things were pared down to where they worked really well for the limitations of a console with a controller versus a PC with a mouse, and it really made up for those differences in a fantastic way. And it does such a brilliant job with kind of a pseudo history that is based on with Japanese um, history, and, and it works very well. And it's presented fantastically. If you really, if you're a history buff and you, you're not a stickler for like a, a fun strategy game being 100% accurate all the time. This is, can be really fun and it can be really uh, enjoyable and it can really uh, just be a fun way to experience that. But even better, in the next slot here we have Kessin 2, which moved to Chinese uh, history. In Again, it's sort of pseudo-history fun thing, kind of in the way Dynasty Warriors, but uh, a little bit more on the realism side. But adding a little more, it actually went a little more magical here, you could say. A little more fantasy elements added in. And to me, Kessin 2 is Kessin 1, just improved in every single respect. Just an, an amazing experience with Kessen, an even more amazing experience with Kessen too. 
I was not a big fan of the changes of Kessen 3, but Kessen 1 and 2 will forever be some of my favorite strategy games on consoles, and they still hold up really, really well. A lot of fun, and a, and a pair that I come back to very frequently, and if I ever do um, play them, I rarely go back to just like one or two. I pretty much will play one, then two, because they're, they're so similar in many ways, but uh, two just kind of is a slight improvement over everything. Number 146 is Half-Life, and yes, over the years, I have actually come to like the PlayStation 2 version the best. I originally played it Windows 95, really enjoyed it, and I loved just what it added to the idea of playing through a story in a first-person shooter and adding story elements to where it was never like a cutscene, really. It was just kind of an interactive world, and everything felt so alive in the original Half-Life, and I really, I actually like Half-Life better than Half-Life 2, because to me, um, the first part of the game, too, as you're going through like Black Mesa, and the whole thing is you're coming first in the opening where you're going down, um, and you kind of work your way back up as the game goes on. To me, it's almost like a, you're, you're in a giant living puzzle in many ways, and I, just, I really love the way it's structured, and I just, I, we've always loved Half-Life. The original Half-Life is my favorite single-player experience ever with a first-person shooter. There are some first-person shooters where the multiplayer experience makes me like the overall game a little bit more, but as far as the single-player experience, the original Half-Life is my favorite, and I loved the slight improvements are made to the PlayStation 2 version. I thought it translated so perfectly well. This, to me, was just incredible, and you can use the keyboard and mouse with this, too, if you want to, over the controller. Um, I've actually come to prefer the controller. I used keyboard and mouse first when I played it because it used to the PC, but um, I, I've really come to enjoy the PlayStation 2 version actually more than the PC version of Half-Life, an amazing classic that really deserves its spot in history and is one of my favorite games. Number 145 is another instance where I come to enjoy the console version more than the PC version, which is it's, again is, a, is an oddity, but Command & Conquer. I, as I said before, I like RTS games on PC. I enjoyed Command and & Conquer, and I recently, at uh, two years ago, I think, at Too Many Games, I picked up Command & Conquer on the N64. I've always been curious, um, and I played it, and I really kind of liked the changes they made to it as far as uh, the visuals, and I really enjoyed the gameplay. I think it was a good translation. Um, I think gameplay-wise, it really works well, as well as it can with the N64 controller. I think it was done very well, and I kind of going back and playing this game again, I would pick this version over the PC version that I originally played. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing experience and a great way to kick off a fantastic and legendary series that for me, over time, is not quite as good as it once was. Number 144 is Command & Conquer Red Alert, which um, to me it just took Command & Conquer, improved everything a little bit, and just came out with another amazing package. Next we get into some Genesis love with number 143, the original Sonic the Hedgehog, one of my first Genesis games, loved that, and I think it just kind of kept getting better in my opinion as far as I love them. Next Sonic 2, and then number 141, Sonic 3. I just love the Genesis trilogy, they're so much fun. I'm awful at Sonic, I'll be the first person to tell you that, my wife always makes fun of me because she's so much better at the Sonic Genesis games than I am, and I think I like them more than she does, which is, you know, weird, but, um, yeah, I just, there are games that you can constantly come back to, and we have these three games on other platforms, you know, like Genesis Collections on the PS2, and the Sonic Collections on the DS, and PSP, and whatever, that I don't mind, like, rebuying them a million times, and they're just, they're always fun in every iteration, but I will always come back to you given the choice, the original Genesis versions, and these are just some, some great childhood memories, and they're some of the very few Genesis games that I originally had in the 90s, um, and it just was, that was why I had my system plugged in for many, for many reasons, where these three games and one other is going to come up later, those are the main reasons I had that Genesis hooked up to the TV for as long as I did. Number 140, the DS remake of Final Fantasy III. This was spectacular. I had so much fun with this game, and I had never played Final Fantasy III before. Um, not Final Fantasy VI, not the three, you know, Super Nintendo and US, the actual Final Fantasy III. I had never played that one before in any form, and I really loved this DS remake. Uh, I've never played the uh, original even since then. I don't think I ever will really. I'm just really happy with this. I found this to be an incredible, incredible, enjoyable experience, and just a great classic RPG fun adventure. Number 139, another early PS2 game, Dark Cloud. Dark Cloud 2 I've never had a chance to play. I think I would like it, but I don't think from what I've seen of it, and uh, I have a couple friends who've played through it multiple times, I don't think I would like it quite as much as 1. 1 just has a very 
and, and a very interesting look and feel to it and it feels very Ocarina of Time in some ways and then also very much a brutal dungeon crawler in other ways and I like the rebuilding the town element and there's so much in here that's so fun and creative and it's kind of it reminds me of a lot of other fantastic games without feeling ever like just kind of a straight copy of them. Uh, to me it takes a lot of fantastic elements and creates a very a fantastic original package and Level 5 over the years has become one of my favorite developers. They've done such a good job with so many games and I was very happy to grab this. I remember when this came out, this was the first real big RPG on the console. Uh, there were a few before then, but this is the first one that was kind of like a big deal, I remember, and it really lived up to the hype. It was an amazing game. Number 138, The Rise of Kasai. Number 137, The Mark of Kree. The first one I do like a little bit better than its sequel. Both games that were on my Hidden Gems list for the, PC, uh, for the uh, PlayStation 2 because they are amazing, violent, stealthy action games that have a wonderful aesthetic and they have a fairly unique art style as far as cultural representation within gaming. You get a whole lot of typically medieval western, you get a lot of Japanese styling, sometimes Chinese, and it's very rare that you get a lot of representation outside of those areas. It's not very often, and these are fantastic examples of that. And there's incredibly fun games. I do like the first one a little bit better. I'm not quite as much of a fan of having a partner with you for a lot of sections in this one, but still um, almost as good of a game. It's just amazing games that have stuck with me over the years. Level 5 is back with number 136, Rogue Galaxy, and I really, really enjoyed this game. Uh, some of these story elements, a lot of the overall structure of the story are somewhat cliche. Uh, they do draw a lot from other things, and it's not the most original storytelling, but it's done in a way that is still very, very enjoyable and fantastic characters. It's one of the best looking games on the PlayStation 2. Visually, it is incredible. I love the soundtrack and the gameplay is fantastic. It has a lot of those familiar level 5 elements, uh, but it also has a wonderful way of exploration, not just through space, but when you're on the different planets. Like the, the general idea behind the game is very expansive, and it kind of feels, in many ways, has many relations to Final Fantasy XII and Xenoblade Chronicles within the way that you kind of explore the worlds. Um, it's just, it's in a fantastic, massive game. It's it's very expansive. It's, it's just a gorgeous, vibrant experience and so much fun, and there's so much to do in here. Um, I, my first playthrough of this game, I think, was maybe 60 to 70 hours, and that's not really just kind of lollygagging and taking your time. Sometimes it was cool to go around and look at the scenery and have fun with different elements, but that's, there's just so much in here that it's just a remarkable experience, and even beyond just some of the kind of cliched elements of its storytelling, it still is just a, a fantastic experience that you should check out. Number 135, Shadow Hearts. And I love the Judgment Ring system here, kind of this almost uh, like a Wheel of Fortune-esque element to the battle system, but it really comes across as a very interesting way and a captivating addition to what is otherwise a fairly traditional turn-based combat system. And I really like the world that is created in Kudelka before this and then expanded greatly upon in Shadow Hearts, and this is the beginning of a loosely based you know, trilogy in a way. A very fantastic game and I think is very overlooked. Uh, definitely better than that though, in my opinion. One that I have enjoyed so much more is Shadow Hearts Covenant. One of the best um, RPGs on the PlayStation 2 that's probably not quite as well known as other great RPGs on there, like the Final Fantasy series, you know, Dragon Quest, Shimami Tensei, like the Persona games, all those are very popular. I think as far as the ones that aren't quite as much in the, the mainstream, I think this is one of the best ones on that system. And it improves everything from the original Shadow Hearts, in my, in my opinion. I think that um, the storytelling is, is greater and grander without losing the fantastic aesthetic of the first game, the sort of dark, almost horror-esque atmosphere to its RPG um, elements, and it's just, it's a beautiful, gorgeous game. It's something that I really wish hadn't been so overlooked, and it can be harder to find copies of this compared to uh, Shadow Hearts or Shadow Hearts uh, the, uh, from the New World. Um, this is the harder one to find, more expensive, because it, it's well worth it. It's an amazing game that, that uh, is definitely worthy of being on this list. And in saying that, though, I do have a soft spot for Kudelka, the first game in the series, number 133 on my list here, favorite games. It plays a little bit differently. It's a little bit more of a strategy RPG in its combat, and it feels much more like a hybrid of a survival horror game 
with an RPG in, in the way that you explore and move about in the game. It feels like a, the, the horror vibes, I think, are much more pronounced in this than in later games in the series, and I kind of like the fusion that this creates even more than the games that came after it. Number 132, some more PS1 Squaresoft love with Threads of Fate. Two amazing adventures. Threads of Fate is a, an incredible action adventure kind of RPG with uh, really great elements as far as like Mint and Rue. And Mint, you're using different uh, magical abilities and the transformations with Rue and how you use them for kind of puzzle solving in the environments. I did a review of this. Uh, check that out. It is a fantastic game on the PlayStation 1 that has stuck with me over the years. Ever since I first played a demo of it, I'm like, wow, this has a, a really captivating kind of upbeat feel to it. It's a very fun, uh, vibrant, colorful game to play. Speaking of colors, number 131, Mr. Driller. I really like this. I'm not always a big fan of puzzle games, and if they do, they're just kind of casual fun. They wouldn't be nowhere near um, a list of favorites like this, but Mr. Driller over the years, no matter what version you're playing, if you're playing you know, Game Boy Color, if you're playing the Wonder Swan, the Dreamcast, you know, PS1, whatever, Mr. Driller is just awesome and is just so much there's something about it that I have always just found so it, enjoyable and addictive and for some reason I've always just liked this bit more than any other puzzle game number 130 nights into dreams and this is a fantastic fantastic game uh, this is one that really takes advantage of the the 3d controller the on the Sega Saturn and is one that I think works best easily in that original, the original version, that original form, because it really feels so fluid on that system, and especially using that controller. I've never played a game that quite felt like it. Even the sequel on the Wii doesn't quite recapture that same feeling of this original game on the Saturn. It has such a, a beautiful dream-like quality, both to the way it looks and to the way that the the uh, sound design is put through the game, and the way that it plays, and this really great flowy feeling. It honestly feels kind of like this dreamlike flying quality to this game that just is still to this day, I think, fairly unique. Again, even the sequel didn't quite recapture it, even though it was a pretty good game. It has an absolute classic that I really fell in love with the first time I got a chance to play it. Next up, number 129, Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy. I really like Naughty Dog, as you saw a little bit earlier. The Crash, original Crash trilogy was on this list. I really liked them, and this was Naughty Dog taking, in my eyes, the 3D platformer to the next evolution, kind of the way that um, Mario 64 really ushered in sort of the next evolution of platformers, and, and in many ways, into that 3D realm. I think this was kind of, kind of the next step in my mind to how that would translate into the next generation when this very first came out. I absolutely love this. It's so charming and fun and challenging, but it's also the kind of game that you can come back and play over and over again. And uh, my brother got so good at this game, I remember him playing it to where he can beat it in just a couple of hours now, though it just goes through every once in a while. Uh, you know, like a Saturday, I've seen him do it, he just goes through and just sits there for an afternoon and plows through the whole thing. Cause, uh, it's one of those things where as you get used to it and as you kind of keep coming back to it, you get better at it and you start memorizing things, it becomes less challenging but still equally fun. Um, just fantastic. I love the way the the Every level is a very separate environment, but they're all so interconnected that it's just kind of one world, and then you go off to the other little island, but it's basically just kind of like one one place with separate sections, and it flows together so masterfully. I think this this is just such an incredible game, and I liked Jack 2 and 3. Uh, they're nowhere to be seen on this list because I didn't like them anywhere near as much as this. They went in a completely different direction. It still plays, in, with the, aside from the gunplay and things like that, it plays very in a very similar manner in those, and I did really enjoy them, but as much as I liked them, I really wished Jack 2 and 3 were more like this, and I feel like it, something was lost in trying to make them, I guess, more um, directly related to like Ratchet and Clank in some ways, uh, more um, action-oriented, uh, just, it didn't, I don't know, I liked the story, I liked I liked playing them, they were enjoyable, but they just really missed out on the the wonderful classic feeling of this, and I think over time, I might play Jack 2 and 3 one more time over the course of my lifetime, like maybe. This I'll replay every few years probably, because it's just a, a wonderful adventure, and to me again, felt like the next step in 3D platform gaming. It's just a gorgeous experience. Next up, 128, is Roller Coaster Tycoon. And yeah, it, it is that high on this list. The original Roller Coaster Tycoon, I sunk so many hours into, and I'm usually not a fan of that type of sim gaming. 
but for some reason I found that captivating, and I still do, playing the original, you know, PC version of Roller Coaster Tycoon, and um, Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, and things like that, those are all good, but there's something about that first one that I just found to be just such a fun experience, and uh, Theme Park I'd played before that, and I kind of liked it, but nothing to me before or since has really captured the essence of the, that original Roller Coaster Tycoon, and I just have always found that to be so incredibly entertaining, and something that I will constantly come back to every once in a while. Next up, number 127, is my favorite in the Resident Evil series. I said before that I think overall 4 I would consider to be the best in the series because it takes the best of the old and the new, but my favorite is still always going to be Resident Evil 2. That to me was such a brilliant sequel and it took everything that I liked about the first game and made it better and then added so much to it. And I really, I think I liked, I don't know, I just have a particular affinity for um, the story and the, the where it took place and, and the structure of the puzzles, just something about it that I enjoyed the most out of the rest of the series. And bizarrely, even I played it originally on the PlayStation 2 and it's on how many other systems now, I actually like the N64 version the best and I think part of it was I was blown away that it was actually on the N64 because if you look at it, how many N64 games or ports of, you know, PlayStation games or whatever are missing things like their CGI cutscenes or there are issues with uh, the sound quality isn't quite as good. If you look at the port of, like, uh, Mortal Kombat 4, it's missing, you know, the CGI sequences from the PlayStation version. And that's not a huge loss, but it's more extreme, like, per game. But it just shows where it was imp so impressive when it first came out that Resident Evil 2 ran as well as it did on the N64 in cartridge form. I was just, I just remember being blown away by that because I didn't think that they were going to be able to pull it off. And in some ways, it's inferior to the PlayStation version. In other ways, it's definitely superior to the PlayStation version. Um, and overall, I think I just had the most enjoyable experience in that form. And I actually like the N64 version the best. That's my favorite version of that game for some reason. Um, so yeah, my favorite Resident Evil, my favorite version is the N64 version. Next up, 126 is Fatal Frame 3, 125 is the original Fatal Frame, and 124 is Fatal Frame, Crimson Butterfly, and all three of these are just fantastically creepy games. I am, I think for some reason video games have more power to scare me than a movie or a book or anything like that, only because you're physically interacting with the environment that you find terrifying. And to me, have, it almost feels more like you're actually in that environment than from a more passive experience. Uh, but even saying that, I very rarely have had anything more than like a jump scare, kind of like be a frightening experience for video games, with the exception of the Fatal Frame games. I don't know what it is. There's something about those games that I've always found just horrifying and, and creepy and, and but terrifying in such a, a beautiful alluring way. It's this 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 beautiful frightening romance with the way that these games play out to where I get captivated in them and ever since I played the first Fatal Frame it just kind of like I didn't want to put it down. There's almost this like oh my gosh like I'm gonna freak out if I stop playing this. I just gotta push through and I just really enjoyed that experience with that that first game. It just resonated with me so powerfully that I you had an equally great experience with 2 and 3, and just overall I think 2 um, turned out to be the, the best as far as its presentation and its, its storyline and its play style. Uh, 3 changed things up a little bit and I still really liked um, the, the, I like the changes that they made, but it didn't quite live up to the classic feel of the first or the, the near perfection of Crimson Butterfly. And I really want to play the kind of remaster, remake, whatever of Crimson Butterfly on the Wii. I definitely want to import that sometime and I want to play 4. Um, it really annoyed me that we did not get a physical copy on the Wii U of the, the last Fatal Frame game because it's probably one I'll never play because of that, so I really wanted a physical copy of that. But uh, yes, I really like this series. It's one of my favorite horror series. might even overall be my favorite above Resident Evil. I just really love those three games, and I can't wait to play the, the handful that I haven't played yet on the Wii, but just fantastically frightening adventures, and I love the camera system. I think it's something that I thought was going to be goofy. When I very first played the, the, the original Fatal Frame on PlayStation 2, I actually thought it was going to be kind of goofy and stupid. I didn't really, just on paper, I didn't like the idea of the camera obscura, and like I just thought it was going to be kind of dumb. But it ended up being amazing and creative, and I love that system. 
Next up, 123 is Fantasy Star 4 on the Genesis. This, along with the Sonic games, were the biggest reasons that I kept my Genesis, you know, powered on as, much, as long as I did. Kept it hooked up to the TV because I really like this. I enjoyed the Fantasy Star series, but none of them have captivated me quite as much as 4. For some reason, that was just like that was the big RPG for me on the Genesis. Kind of how you had like Final Fantasy 4 and 6 and like Chrono Trigger and things like that on the Super Nintendo. To me, the equivalent on the Genesis to that was Fantasy Star 4. I just really enjoyed that game and I still love to play it today. Next up, 122, Final Fantasy Tactics War of the Lions. I played it on PS1 and was at first kind of not sure what to think of it because it's not what I was expecting because I had been a fan of the uh, Final Fantasy series since the NES and I really enjoy strategy games but I've never been a massive fan of strategy games of this style. The strategy games that I tend to enjoy are more like Command and Conquer, Warcraft, Starcraft, you know, that, that's more of the, that real-time strategy element. So I didn't know what to think of it at first and I remember the first time I played it, I kind of liked it, but I never really finished it. I went back and played it again, enjoyed it much more, but it really wasn't until I played the PSP version, the update with a better translation and things. It just, to me, overall, the this is the best version in my opinion. I know some people like the PS1 version better. I think it's just uh, up to personal taste, but replaying it in this form gave me a whole new appreciation for it. And even though it's still probably not my favorite style of gameplay, Having played more games of that style over the years, I've come to appreciate how amazingly almost perfect it is and as far as that, that form of, of strategy gameplay on a console, that form of strategy RPG. It really is the best I've played of that, and I really don't think I appreciated that at first until I've expanded and played more games of that type. That I think that right out, you know, right out of the gate, it came out and was the best at the time, and to me, in many ways, is still the best today of that form. And just the world and the story, I think the story is what really, really, really holds up the best in here, and I think that's the the element that brings me back to it even more than the gameplay. Some more Squaresoft love with number 121, Vagrant Story, I uh, return to Ivelisse in a way. Um, yeah, the, have you seen this game? If you have not played this game before, visually this is astounding. I love these sort of, it's almost like living, almost like a living comic book, but not in the way of like a, like a, like a Marvel comic book. It's it's almost like living living paper in a way. It's, it's kind of bizarre to, to describe, but it's, it has a fascinating art style that really stands out and just looks so astounding and really helps it age very very well that art style that that art um, over graphical prowess I think it's still an incredible looking game and it's it's a fascinating game to play I loved playing Ashley Riot the risk you know system everything about the the gameplay the similarities to the gameplay style of the first Parasite Eve in some ways um, and then the the crafting systems and everything it just it, felt so unique and challenging and fun and what really drew me in again kind of like Final Fantasy Tactics even more than the interesting and somewhat unique gameplay was really this the art style and the storyline and it just it had just such a a unique cool look when it first came out that it was very captivating and moving on to the next one moving on to the next one here we have more Squaresoft Love uh, was this number 120 right yep number 120 Front Mission 3 and this this is a fantastic strategy game um, gameplay wise I would still I think overall give the nod to Final Fantasy Tactics but I love sci-fi and I love mechs so Front Mission 3 ended up liking a little bit more this is a massive game it took me hours and hours and hours the first time I played it and I went into this actually not realizing what it was um, I at the time like back when this came out there was a time on PS1 where if it said Squaresoft on the cover I just kinda bought it I didn't even care what it was, I just bought it. Um, and I played through every Squaresoft game on that system, and some were better than others, this is one of the best, and this was just such a remarkable experience. And I played Front Mission 4 since then, um, I've not played 5, I've not gone back and played 1 and 2, and 4 though, I don't know, for some reason didn't capture um, my attention quite as much as 3. This is just a fantastic game that I will come back to uh, yet again in the future, it's just a huge time commitment. But uh, yeah, an absolutely amazing game and that that love of mechs that I have it really kind of stood out over something like Final Fantasy Tactics just more from uh, the differences even though they're both console strategy RPGs and uh, in a similar vein I just I loved all the mech detail in this number 119 more Squaresoft love on the PS1 Air Guys and I was like so many people I bought Air Guys for two reasons 
it said Squaresoft on the cover, and it had Final Fantasy VII characters in it. <laughs> that was that was it. I had not played it in the arcade or anything. I just I bought it day one, and it could have been just a cash in that had you know a cheap fighting game that threw these couple characters in from Final Fantasy VII due to its popularity and been terrible. But it was actually really fun. Air Guy is, is still a lot of fun to bring out every once in a while, and it plays. It, it's a very, it has a very different fighting system from many other, um, many other different fighting games at the time, and and it was a very unique experience. I think took a little bit of getting used to it for me and my friends because it's so different from any other fighting games we were playing at the time. But once we got into it, um, the novelty of having uh, like Cloud and Sephiroth and, and Tifa in it kind of wore off, and it was just kind of a fun fighting game. And I liked the sort of mini RPG, as you could almost call it, mini game in there, and other ones like the the race on the beach to the flag, and like there were just kind of enough of a little extra to really add that extra that extra quality to it that 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 extra like bang for your buck and it just made it a fantastic experience and it's still interesting enough game and unique enough today that I can still come back and really really enjoy it number 118 Dead or Alive 3, Dead or Alive up through 3, one of my favorite fighting uh, game series uh, 4 and onward I didn't quite like quite as much but 3 when this came out I was blown away. Because I had loved the original PlayStation so much, I, had, I, was a, I was a PS1 nut. I've always, you know, it's, it's no longer my absolute favorite system, but during the, the lifespan of the original PlayStation, I've never been more dedicated to a single console in my life. Crazy. Because of that, I was a hardcore PlayStation 2 nut. One of the few games that made me really start to appreciate the original Xbox, which I pretty much just bought for Shamu 2. One of the few games then that I got after that that made me appreciate that console was Dead or Alive 3. Holy cow, this game is still gorgeous. When you look at this, playing on just an original Xbox, it is beautiful. It really, really holds up, and I can't express the like just the joy of and the awe of seeing this for the first time, putting this into the original Xbox, and like, holy crap, this game is so pretty. And then you play it, and it was so much fun. Not everyone likes the system um, in the Dead or Alive games. To me, I really enjoy it, and this was just beautiful. I, I loved every second of it. I loved being able to like break through the stages and like all the elements that I loved from from Dead or Alive 2 on you know the Dreamcast and the um, PlayStation 2. All the elements I loved about those were back in full form, and in some ways even bigger and better and more beautiful. And as much as I think Dead or Alive 3 improved on many elements of Dead or Alive 2, I actually like Dead or Alive 2 a little bit more. Number 117, Dead or Alive 2. Dead or Alive 2 Hardcore on the PlayStation 2 just has a special place in my heart because my favorite gaming memory ever is renting a PlayStation 2 not long after it came out and a huge stack of games, like almost every game that was out at that point. And this is one of the ones that we played. And I just, every game that I played that over that three or four day whatever rental period that I had where I rented the PS2, saved me up to buy one. Every one of those games that we had is somewhere on this top 200 because I just had such a fond memory of that moment. It's my favorite gaming moment ever. And every one of those games are games that I bought then eventually and I played the heck out of for years and I still play them today. Every one of those I just fell in love with immediately. So Dead or Life 2 has a special place in my heart, whether it's the PS2, I do like in the, the Ultimate collection here on the original Xbox, that's good. This is probably my fondest memory of that game. Overall though, I think my favorite version though has become the Dead or Alive 2 on the Dreamcast. Um, I, this is the Japanese Dreamcast version here. I just really like the Dreamcast, and I really like the Dreamcast controller so much, and even though more of my memories are with the PlayStation 2 version, Hardcore, I actually have enjoyed playing the Dreamcast version a little bit more as time moves on, just because I love the feel of that controller, and it really works for me for this uh, this type of fighting game. Number 116, Pokemon Stadium on the N64. What is the N64 without its awesome collection of Pokemon games? We played the heck out of Pokemon Stadium. That was a huge deal when that came out. I was the right age for when uh, Pokemon became very popular in the United States. I was in elementary school and playing those games on the Game Boy and then also collecting the cards. That was an obsession and that was the first time we experienced uh, something was banned from the elementary school. We weren't allowed to bring in Pokemon cards and that was, that was a, a huge phenomenon just for a few years while I was in elementary school and then 
one of the biggest things ever was to get Pokemon Stadium be able to play um, your Pokemon in full 3D. Even if it had just been the stadium element, just battling your Pokemon, it still would have been just such a, a fun experience in that perfect moment. But then you also had all the great mini games that were just a, a lot of fun to sit and play with your friends. And I remember the Clefairy, like the, me the memorization game and things like that. And just the carp, carp, like full, full, uh, you know, make him pop up and hit the, the counter. And uh, just it was just such a fun game that came right at the right time. It's one of those games where if I had not been captivated in, in that beginning uh, Pokemon, Pokemon you know, phenomenon, which I really have not been a fan of Pokemon since that original bit. There's only Pokemon things I really enjoy. Um, if I hadn't been wrapped up in that and been a little bit older or, or younger, I probably wouldn't have this game anywhere near this list. It's just the, the memory of that time with that game was so exciting. And then right on top of it, and you might call me crazy, but my favorite Pokemon game of all time is Pokemon Snap on the N64. So number uh, 115, Pokemon Snap, and it sounds absurd, and it's one of those games that if someone has never played it before, and you tell them you're just going through stages on rails, taking pictures of Pokemon, it sounds so dumb, but it is so much fun. I think part of it comes from my love of all those uh, arcade light gun games, how much I really, really enjoy those, because it's kind of like that, except you're taking pictures instead of shooting them. It just has that feel, those on those uh, on rails light gun games. And it just was so exciting, and again, came out that perfect time. If it had been a different time, wouldn't liked it so much, but it just, it's fun. And I love when you, you do get people who've never played it before to play it for the first time, and it sounds stupid, and they start playing it, and then they end up playing it for three or four hours, which is like, wow, oh, this is so much fun. Like, why is this so much fun? And then you had the added element of, I remember um, going just like one or two times to uh, a Funko Land near me and printing out pictures of your Pokemon. That was such a cool, like, novel concept, and it was uh, just a fun kind of extra gimmick to it, but such a fun game and one that I still play. My brother, every once in a while, will come and, and play it with me on the N64. We'll drag that out. We'll play Pokemon Stadium and Snap, and... It's just so much fun, and it's weird that that is my favorite Pokemon game, but it truly is when I really think about it. That's the one that I go back to, and there's a missed opportunity. Why didn't we get one on the Wii U? I really hope they remedied that with the Switch. We need Pokemon Snap, too. That would be incredible. Speaking of the Switch, number 114, Splatoon 2. We have only had a Switch for, as of now, a little over three months. Um, actually, just about three months. Um, and there are two games on this list already from the Switch. I really am I'm, I'm surprised and amazed how much I'm enjoying that console so far, and I've not had a chance to play Splatoon. I haven't got my hands on a Wii U yet. I was waiting, and then I had enough money to buy one, and then the Switch was coming out. So I'm like, alright, I'm gonna wait for the Switch and get a Wii U, and then Nintendo pulled like Wii U's from the shelves, and the prices are still crazy for a new one. Whatever. Eventually I'll get a Wii U. So I've not played Splatoon, but Splatoon 2, I was excited to finally get a chance to play Splatoon because I wanted to play the original one. Splatoon 2 is fantastic. I love running through the single player campaign. Multiplayer, of course, is kind of the, the bread and butter or something like this, but just the creativity of this is spectacular. It, it's one of the most original games I've played in years. Um, just I, I really, really love everything about it. The music, uh, just visually, it's it's so catchy. Everything about it is just fantastic and, and fun and vibrant and colorful in this world of so many dark gray and brown dystopian uh, video games. And it's just a fun, colorful shooter. That are, this, in many ways, something about this reminds me of the glory days of like uh, beautiful, colorful, vibrant, arcadey type stuff on the Dreamcast. Like that's kind of what this reminds me of those days, and I'm really enjoying that so much that a game that you know we've only had the the console for like three months, we've only had that game for about a month, and it's already like in my top 200. It's almost breaking into the top 100. Amazing game. Number 113 is Zone of the Enders, and 112 is Zone of the Enders Second Runner. These are both amazing games. I like to call them the greatest Gundam games ever made that are not Gundam games. <laughs> Just because of the the style of mech and the style of gameplay, um, it reminds me uh, of Gundam in many ways. Uh, the, uh, like Gundam Encounters in Space on PS2, I liked playing that. These are just, though, that type of, of, of mech versus the big hulking sort of western style mech in like a mech warrior or something, that type of mech, these, these are the two ultimate games, number one and two. One, I think, I think they're underappreciated because one, as you see here, I think one sold a lot of copies because people wanted the demo of Metal Gear Solid 2 and didn't actually play the game and they really missed out on an incredible game. The downfall of one is that it's very, very short. It seems like uh, the first Zone of the Enders is more of, can we do this? 
and then it proved that yes we can, so two came out and it was the full-fledged, like, this is awesome. And they're just both such amazing games, and definitely my favorite kind of like action mech games. They beat out all the real, like, actual, actual Gundam games, my love of Gundam. These are just amazing. And they, especially with the second one, they pulled together a pretty fascinating story and some pretty memorable characters and environments, and I really like the soundtrack to both of these games. I really, really enjoy the soundtrack. There's something just odd and eerie and otherworldly about it, the, that it just it sticks in your mind. I can, I can hear it. At a moment's notice, I can just be like, alright, I can hear the Zone of the Ender soundtrack. It's such an incredible experience, both those games. Number 111, Sonic Adventure on the Dreamcast. Particularly that first level, I is just burned into my mind. The entire game I absolutely love, but just the f moment of playing through for the first time and going through just those first couple stages, that is my probably like my greatest memory of the first time I played the Dreamcast is just the first, you know, hour or so of playing Sonic Adventure. It just it's mind blowing. And this is my favorite Sonic game, easily, of all time. I really, really like Sonic Adventure. And even stuff like going in and playing uh, like the, the pinball and like the Nights in the Dreams pinball and stuff like even little things like that just added so much to it. There's so much that's awesome about it. And I think in many ways the first Sonic Adventure encapsulates so much of what I love about the Dreamcast and just and the memory of the first time I played it and then the the experience of when I finally got a Dreamcast back in my collection years later after, you know, college and things like that and started getting back a lot of these games and playing new Dreamcast games and just the first Sonic Adventure is such a remarkable experience, and it's just everything everything about it just burned into my mind. It's like the future is here. Sega is going to take things over. Like that's one of the games where the Dreamcast came out in the middle of my like PlayStation obsession, and for a bit it actually challenged my love of the PlayStation 2. And it wasn't it was only because I ended up not having access after a while to a lot of uh, Dreamcast games in my area after they kind of left the main, uh, main stores and Sega dropped the console. Um, I really think that in a different world, the Dreamcast would have been the game that I, the, the console that I played like a million games on rather than the PS2 in those early 2000 years. And this is one of the best experiences, still one of the best experiences, and I will come back to this constantly. I really, this to me is, it's my favorite Sonic game. I love Sonic, I love Sega. Sonic Adventure is just incredible. Number 110 is one that's going to make you go, what? But it's awesome. It is a licensed game from a TV series, but it's really darn good. Xena Warrior Princess on the PS1. The Xena game on the N64, a fighting game, pretty good. Hercules game, atrocious. Xena also got a game on the PlayStation, and it is one of the best action-adventure games I've ever played. To me, still, that chakram mechanic through this game is one of the most fun mechanics I've ever played in an action game ever. I love it. It's so much fun when you get good at this game to like just explore and have fun with different things and it is done so incredibly well. It's just a tie-in game for a TV series but it is awesome and it's one of those games where even if you've never seen an episode of Xena Warrior Princess, if you like PS1 action adventure games, check it out. It's that good. You don't have to be a fan of the license to enjoy it. It's just awesome. If you are a fan of Xena though, this is like one of the best tie-in games ever. It's fantastic. Number 109, Jet Li's Rise to Honor. This is a, the playable Hong Kong action flick. It is fantastic. It is so much fun. I don't know why more people didn't play this game and love this game. I put this on my Hidden Gems for the PlayStation 2. I'm going to talk about it here. This is awesome. Find a copy of this game. Some people don't like one of the main reasons why I like it. Some people understand it and love it. The amazing combat system using the analog sticks, like the flicking in different directions to do different attacks and stuff like To me, I, it feels so cool and it's so different from just button presses or quick time events, that type of thing. It's, it's a really cool new way of controlling a character that has kind of been done in some elements before, but never to this extent and never to this extreme level of, of competence. It just plays so well. To me, it's, it's one of the most fluid action games I've ever played, and it's so much fun. And again, it's just kind of like a, a playable Hong Kong action flick. It's a playable Jet Li movie, and it is badass. Number 108 is Fragile Dreams for the Nintendo Wii. This is probably still my favorite review I've ever done of a game, uh, Fragile Dreams, Farewell Ruins of the Moon, for the Nintendo Wii. This is uh, such a flaw of beauty because in some ways it's one of my absolute favorite like, games ever. I mean, it's obviously it's, it's on here, but it's hard to explain without spoiling anything, but it's kind of like it lost its way somewhere along, along the way. The first couple hours of this game 
would honestly, I would say, the experience would be a top 50 games of all time. It would be even higher on this list. But somewhere along the way, it just kind of lost its way and it fell a bit for me. Uh, the second, you know, half isn't quite as good. The final third, I think, has great moments, but there are so many things that are just not, don't live up to the potential that the first, you know, few hours of this game held. But this, this to me is still one of the best examples of art over just pure processing power and one of the greatest examples of why if you give the Wii a chance there's some amazing hidden gems on there. I absolutely adore this game. I love so much about it. It's just, it, it's just sad that part way along the way things just kind of fell apart towards the end of the game but overall it's still one of my absolute favorite games. Number 107 is 100% pure fandom. <laughs> absolutely. Quark's Bar right here. Star Trek Deep Space Nine Harbinger. This is an old point-and-click adventure game that I originally played on my old Mac and now I have the PC version here and you could really sum this game up into two parts. Part one, it's like you're actually on Deep Space Nine. It's like you're exploring the space station. It's like you're there interacting with these characters from an early season of the show. Disc two is one of the most frustrating experiences I've ever had in my entire life as far as playing video games infuriating, but I still wanted to see through to the end to like finish it, but the first disc I'll say of this is definitely what makes it earn this spot because, I mean, look at this packaging, this is awesome. I'm a Deep Space Nine super fan. It's my favorite, favorite television show of all time. It's my favorite work of science fiction ever. I love Star Trek in general, in all forms. I love Star Trek, but Deep Space Nine is my absolute favorite, and I can't explain how exciting it is to be a kid in elementary school and to be, to be someone who grew up on the next generation and and the original series and then Deep Space Nine comes out and falling in love with that and then this comes your, your dad brings this home for you and he says here look at this and you see this amazing box he has incredible packaging you're like holy cow what is this and then you load the game and it is a playable episode basically Deep Space Nine and for the time too I mean now it would be kind of laughable the level of exploration but at the time going in there and having the actual be able to see the characters and actually talk to them and interact and ask them questions be able to walk around ops be able to walk around you know it, it just it's amazing be able to go to quarks and things it blew my mind and even though it, objectively it's really not that great of a game it, it's one of my favorite games ever. It's almost in the top 100. We're getting up there. Uh, we're almost done with part one here, the longest one of these by far. Um, it, it just, it, to me, it just I have so much love and a passion and nostalgia for that game that even though it's not that great, uh, just the experience and the memory of it will last the rest of my life. Number 106, Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast. Holy cow, this is an awesome game. It was fun in the arcades. I actually had a lot more fun on the Dreamcast. It still is a gorgeous game. It's so amazing. I played um, Soul Edge or Soul Blade, depending on what region you went on the PS1, and I kind of liked it, but it wasn't until Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast that I was blown away by that series and really, really enjoyed it. Though it is slightly edged out by its sequel, Soul Calibur 2. Number 105, Soul Calibur 2, and this was to me, in many ways, just a slight improvement over Soul Calibur, but what really sold me on it was that I can't imagine how many copies of this game were sold just to me and my friends, because you had the the, the exclusive characters on the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube and, and the original Xbox, and it was basically just the same the same thing with, you know, you had Hiachi on the PlayStation 2 version, you had Link on the GameCube, and you had Spawn on the Xbox, and that was pretty cool. Yeah, I bought all three versions back when it came out. Um, Almost all my friends bought all three versions, or at least two of them, depending on what consoles they had. Like, everyone had multiple copies of that game when it came out that I knew. Everyone had so many copies. We played so much of that game, we completely bought into the marketing. I remember the old commercials, like, we completely bought into the, the, the character on each system. It just, it worked. It worked. Uh, I'll openly admit we gave into that marketing, and it totally worked. Um, overall, um, I actually think I like the GameCube version the best, and we played that the most. Um, I really think that that was kind of the coolest entry too to have Link in as far as the extra characters. So overall, I would give it to the GameCube version as being my favorite version of that one, followed by the Xbox and then the PlayStation 2 version. Um, just an amazingly fun time. Yeah, we totally bought into the marketing at the time. Just at the, at the time, it's kind of ridiculous, but now it's, that's actually part of the fun memory in a way. Number 104 is Tekken 4, and a lot of people didn't like the subtle, the subtle changes to the gameplay in Tekken 4 compared to Tekken 3 and Tournament, and then they changed a lot of the style of gameplay 
back for Tekken 5. Um, I actually liked a lot of the changes in Tekken 4. I, I do like the older style better, Tekken you know, 3 and Tournament and things like that, but I really actually I really appreciate what they tried to do here, and I think this is a fascinating entry in the series. I think it's a little more underappreciated than it should be when you look at the overall popularity of different entries in the series, and I liked the, the I don't know, I, I like so much of the way it played out and the return of some of the extra modes and things like that. However, saying that I do like Tekken 5 a little bit more, my next one here is Tekken 5. Uh, this, to me, is the last Tekken that I really, really enjoyed. I was disappointed by 6. haven't really played any others past 6. 6 was the last one I played. Um, and this is one of my favorite fighting game franchises, even above, like, Dead or Alive. I, I was always a Tekken nut. I love getting, like, crazy juggles and stuff. We, we played so much Tekken, starting with Tekken 1 on the PS1, all through, like, uh, through Tekken 5, and then 6. I just didn't play too much. But Tekken 5, to me, was the last great entry in an amazing series, and just was sort of a pinnacle at the, at the time. And it looks gorgeous. If you go back and look at that, like, when that came out, the, the difference between, like, early PS2 games and late PS2 games, because the system lasted such a long time, was incredible. Compared to any other console, like, the, the, the difference, the span of how games looked and played and sounded on the, PC, on the PlayStation 2 was remarkable, and this is one of the better examples. Loved playing that game. We're down to the last two on this video, the longest of this four-part series. I just wanted to get the la the uh, the bottom half one and the done one big chunk because I think uh, spend a little more time maybe with some of the later ones here as I'm going along filming. But number 102, we have Speed Punks. I really like uh, the sort of mascot kart racer thing. Started with uh, so with uh, Mario Kart on Super Nintendo, and that spun off into a whole genre really. And there've been so many imitations of that. And I have I have a lot on the PS1, like you know, Muppets and Smurfs, and I don't even know how many uh, old like kart racers like this. There are so many, and a lot of them are just bad. A lot of them are cash in. Some are varying degrees of quality. I think the Crash series has been one of the most successful as far as pulling off great gameplay. And also Speed Punks. And Speed Punks, I, I don't even think this has a great assist. I think this is overlooked. And it's fantastic. This is one of the best kart racers ever. If you like Mario Kart and that kind of stuff, check that out. It's amazing. And number 101, the last one on this list Blood Omen Legacy of Cain. This is such a great game. I played this on the PC back in the day first. I was very happy that it got a port to the original PlayStation. Really enjoyed this. I do like the rest of the games in the Legacy of Kane series better. I appreciate the style of this and I like it and I have a very nostalgic feeling for this because it reminds me of all the old PC RPGs and things like that I played, but I do like more of the almost, you could say, almost Tomb Raider-esque adventure style of the later games, so uh, those are actually on the later video. You'll, you'll give a, giving a little bit away here, but uh, Blood Omen, The Legacy of Cain, amazing, and I do think that this one is overlooked as far as that series is concerned. I think a lot of people start with Soul Reaver um, and move forward from there, so if you are a fan of that series and you haven't tried the first one, check it out, and if you haven't played any of them, play that one first. It's a really great way to start the series, and I think it's a fantastic translation of an, an RPG from the PC to the PlayStation and started an incredible franchise that really was going to turn into one of the, the greats, I think, in many ways of storytelling and gaming. So that is it for part one. That was, again, this is the biggest part I wanted to pump out. Those first 100, there's going to be three more sections here. Our videos will be a little bit shorter, I'm assuming, but yeah, a whole huge variety and just so much fun. And it's just so crazy that how many uh, more games are to go. There's so much fun, and just my, my passion for these games is going to grow with each video because they just get better and better. Um, I absolutely love every game that I showed here today, though, and uh, tell me which ones you've played before and you have a lot of love for and what ones you have never played, and just, you know, I'd love some interaction, some just any kind of discussion that you have about this video. I, I'm hoping you're having fun with this. I'm having a lot of fun doing it. I think it's a very exciting thing, and I think it, uh, this type of video, favorite video games and stuff, really tells a lot about your history and who you are as a person. And as far as video games are involved, and I'm just, yeah, having a lot of fun. I'm gonna go film part two after I charge this camera.